Jerry Wills was born an orphan in 1953, and he was left to die alone in a cold Kentucky farmhouse. But he was rescued and adopted by a Kentucky family who had a farm there. In 1965, at age 12 and a half on a cold fall day, he was stacking wood at sundown when a silver blimp-shaped aerial vehicle appeared under a full moon over some tall pine trees. There were large pale lights on this craft, and they pulsed one after the other around the center, going in one direction and then reversing in a slow, steady pulse. There was no wind, but the tops of the pine trees whipped back and forth as if the silver UFO was emitting some kind of energy. In his mind, Jerry Wills, at age 12 and a half, heard a telepathic thought voice from whoever was in the silver craft say that the unseen visitors would return to meet Jerry again in the future. And a year later, in July 1966, Jerry was face to face with a tall, blonde-haired, blue-eyed extraterrestrial man who called himself Zoe. And here now to join us to talk about this extraordinary conscious face-to-face contact with an extraterrestrial who said he was from Tau Ceti is Jerry Wills. And Jerry, can you take us back to that day in 1966, July, when you are meeting? How did this happen and what occurred? Well, it wasn't something that I thought was (laughs) going to happen at all. You know, when I'd seen this thing you know, back before, it it was just astonishing. And I was going to run over to where it was at. It was only a quarter mile away from me, across a a flat field. But as I I got ready to do that, it it told me to not do that and that they would be back to see me again. Well, exactly as you had stated, I was to meet a friend of mine down in the woods. We were going to a place called Spook Hollow. And in this area of Kentucky, there had been a lot of Civil War battles fought, a lot of action had taken place. And this one particular area we had never been to, and everyone said it was haunted. So that sounded good. We were going to go down and see about this haunted place down in in the woods. It was a bit of a distance from where I lived. I showed up. And my friend did not. Um, I figured, you know, he had a little bit further to go. Perhaps I should just wait. And that's what I did. Sat down on a large mound of bright green moss, leaned against a tree, and just waited. It was very hot. It was summertime. And in this area of Kentucky, you know, late July, mid July, it's very steamy. <clears throat> So I just have on cutoffs and a a bit of a T-shirt and uh, some hiking, well, some boots, not exactly hiking boots back then. They were actually uh, military surplus. I heard a sound of someone approaching, so I just leaned against the tree and acted like, ha ha, you know, you took so long I fell asleep. The sound came around in front of me and stopped. And I thought it was Randy, so I open my eyes and look up, and here's this man standing there. Well, you know, this is this is back, you know, in in the late '60s, um, mid '60s, right in there, and you know, there were hippies with long hair, and you know, all this going on. The fellow had long hair; it was a blondish color, but he had on this one piece outfit that you couldn't even tell where the pants ended and became shoes. Now, looking back from this time, I would say it was probably a Lycra outfit with built-in shoes, but at the time, no one had ever heard of such a thing and never seen anything like it before. It was very close to his wrist, right down to his to his hand. Uh, it was very tight and form-fitting. It was right up around his neck. He had a a bit of a belt on, but it, it wasn't that distinctive looking. It's a beige jumpsuit. 
Yeah, it was just this this beige color of jumpsuit. Um, so I looked up. I was a little surprised, but didn't really worry me. I said, "Hi, who are you?" And he said, "My name is Zoe." And I was wondering if I could sit down here and talk to you for a few minutes. I said, "Sure, it's fine. It's not a problem." Is it through his lips to your ears, or is it telepathic? Oh, he's smiling and talking just like a person would talk. You know, you could hear him. Well, as he had the most compelling eyes, he had a, had a presence about him. And the longer we talked, the less, you know, suddenly I realized I wasn't using my mouth. I wasn't ver- vocalizing anything. It was like going back and forth with him hmm. in my head. So... It was a short visit. It didn't last all that long. And the whole time I'm thinking, well, I wonder if my friend's going to show up because, you know, he could <laughs> he could meet this guy, see what this is all about. I was fascinated by it. And he said that, uh, I asked him, where are you from? And he says, well, I'm from quite a distance from here. I said, well, where? Uh, somewhere in Europe? And he said, No. And he sort of looked up, and he says, I'm from another world altogether. I said, well, where are you from? And he says, a place called Lanulos. So he started telling me a little bit about it. And Lanulos, he identified as a planet orbiting the star Talcetti, which Mm -hmm. is only a very uh, few light years from our solar system. Right. Yeah, he 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 mentioned the Tal City thing, a uh, whole series of stars. He, he named them off, <clears throat> and he said it was a world very much like this one. It wasn't that much different. He says, of course, you know, every place has got their own unique differences, but um, it's a lot like here. There are people there like me, like you, and. Then, you know, it was as though the conversation was over and he started to get up and he said, do you mind if we talk again sometime? I said, no, that'd be great. I'd really like that. He says, all right, well, then I'll let you know when it's time. And I said, you know, at this point I was going to get up and probably walk with him. That's what I was thinking. And he told me just to stay put that he had to go. And I said, how did you get here? And he says, well, I have, um, I have something over here that I travel in and you should stay here though. I didn't want to, but I found myself feeling kind of weak and a little disoriented. And he stood up and he says, don't worry, I'll see you again. I'll see you soon. And he said, just rest. So, I did. I just felt like that was the best thing in the world to do. <laughs> so he gets up and he goes, and he, I could hear him crunching off through the leaves, and that was the end of it. Um, somewhere in the distance at some point, it seemed like I heard something that didn't make sense, but I don't remember what it sounded like or what it was. Because, you know, you get used to all the sounds being down in the forest like that. I waited there for quite a while, probably another hour my friend never did show up and it was getting later in the day and I had quite a walk to get back home. So I decided just to leave and go back home. Uh, later I talked to my friend and he said that he'd gotten turned around and gotten lost, couldn't find where he's supposed to go. And so he had gone back home. It would be probably another month before I would have another encounter with this fellow and so. the, with Zo, yes. Um, and did he come back to teach you how to fly the craft? Well, there it wasn't that that way immediately. He started coming back about once every week. It would be in the middle of the night. See, we had an outhouse, so getting up in the middle of the night and going outside really wasn't something that was suspicious. And we live way back in the country, so. I would hear this beeping noise. It was kind of like high-speed Morse code, just barely audible. And 
then um, when I would hear that, of course, that's not something you ever hear in that setting. So when I first heard it, it, there was a message with it saying, come outside eventually. So I went outside and just followed the instructions and walked down the path, walked around the edge of the woods to another field way in the back. And uh, then there they would be. Well, it would go on like this for about another four years, maybe longer than that. Well, tell me about his trying to teach you how to fly what essentially looked like a silver lens disc, right? Yeah. It, it, um, this, this thing that he was in on this particular occasion, he wasn't always there in this particular looking thing. And sometimes it looked like an acorn, but um, like a very large bell-shaped thing. But this particular time, he was in the classic UFO shape. And we went inside, and he, I wanted to know how, how he flew this thing. He says, well, I'll show you. So we went to this chair, and I swear, if you have ever seen this show, Flight of the Navigator, how they show this chair and the, the kid puts his hands in there and that sort of thing, it was just so much like that. So this oh. was the hand panels that had been photographed from the 1947 Roswell time period where Zoe would put his fingers into these hands in order to fly the craft? Well, they were depressions, and you lay your hands down and put your fingers in it. Then you would be linked up with this craft. This wasn't a machine. I, I, of course, it was a machine. But he explained that this machine had sentience, that, that it was self-aware, that it was almost like a living thing. And that when he merged with it that way, then he could fly this just with his thoughts. And it, how, it was. How did he teach you that? Well, he taught me that by sitting there and doing it. And of course, we moved, uh, apparently, because you could see outside. There was a, a large panel that, if you were to look at it from the outside, you wouldn't see it, but it was obviously transparent when you got inside. And we moved. And so I tried it. And it wasn't all that successful, but it was, I was able to get it to move a little, but you know, he basically brought it up and down and left and right. And it was, um, it wasn't something that I could do immediately. And I suppose with time I could have, but you know, in, in this, I'm, I'm just a <laughs> 13 year old kid trying to figure out, you know, some of this stuff that, uh, and he's trying to teach me. He's, he's quite good at that. Did he take you to his planet Lanolos or Lanulos in uh, the Tau Ceti solar system? No, but one time, one time he wanted to show me something. So I was inside and he had me go into this this area. It wasn't like it was all large and open on the inside. There was this area that I went inside, uh, like a room. And oddly, you know, it seemed bigger on the inside than it looked on the outside. I can't quite rationalize that. But I went into this room, and there was this, this large cube. <clears throat> so he had me take a look at this. And he was showing me the universe and planets and geology and science and, you know, all kinds of things. Were these projected like holograms from the cube? Well, when, when the cube lit up for just a moment, you could tell there were corners. And then after you started getting involved with it, there were, it was as though it was just stuff floating in the air. And if you moved around, it didn't really change your perspective all that much, but you could move around and see, like to the side of things. I didn't go all the way around the other side of it because he was very intent on showing me some things with this. Well, and in this one particular instance, because uh, I had seen this three or four, maybe five times, um, up to the point that I'm getting to here, he had me sit there and watch, and he sat there with me, 
and I could see the ground just pulling away. It's like I was just looking through a hole in the floor almost. And there were clouds, and then the clouds got further away, and then there was the planet. Uh, it, it was happening so rapidly. And before you know it, there's the moon. And when you see the moon, uh, you're going around to the dark side of the moon. And there on the dark side of the moon, there was this um, this very large thing that he wanted to show me. It was like, um, imagine if he had like a a pipe, like a tube, rounded on the ends, both ends. And you sliced it down the middle and it was hinged. So it sliced down the middle and opened up. And it would sit down. Now you have two half tube shapes with rounded ends. And it was sitting on the moon. And it it must have been quite large from the distance that we were at. And he told me that that was where they stayed. That it was a complete city there. And And it was on the back side of the moon. Right. And uh, when it was time, they would just lift it up. It would join back together again. And then it would go wherever it needed to go, I suppose. Well, I thought that was pretty pretty fascinating. It wouldn't be until many years later that uh, I would see something. I think it was from the Russian probe to Mars. And they had this large tube-like thing <laughs> showing up to go after the satellite. And I just wonder if that's the same thing that I had seen. Um, and... and- would the relationship be between the blonde? Uh, you said his eyes were like looking at pale blue topaz, uh, compelling. So he is one of the blonde, blue eyed uh, types of non humans. And what would his relationship be to what we hear about reptilians and gray ebons and various types and insects? And the fact that you were born a orphan which comes up a lot in the human abduction syndrome. Well, you know, as far as the, uh, the relationship to the reptilians and all of that, it, there, there were so many instances over the course of these years, figuring at least once a week, four years, you've got a couple hundred times that this has happened, that I've had a conversation, sometimes extended conversation with him and the others who came with him. And one of the things that they wanted me to know is about the other people who were out there in the universe, I guess, and, you know, who they were and what they looked like and what their deal was. One of them had to do with this reptilian that was apparently projected into my mind so that I would have an understanding what it would be like to be around them. And it was really quite frightening. It, well, it, and we picked that up after this break. That is perfect. Let's come back and talk to us about Zoe trying to give you the experience of being around a reptilian humanoid. Jerry, you were saying something so important before the break can you now take us into the experience where Zoe is trying to teach you or orient you about the reptilian humanoids? Well, these these occurrences where they would teach me things, uh, they happened like mental telepathy, where there would be, you know, I basically close my eyes and suddenly I would see experience and so forth, just something totally different. Than where I was. In this particular experience, what had happened is that they wanted me to understand what it was like to be around one of these reptilians. It seemed pretty scary, and I felt confident that, you know, it wasn't going to be that bad. But the, uh, the scene that they created was that I was being chased by one of these reptilians, and I was in a bamboo thicket and trying to outmaneuver they told me that the reptilians aren't that uh, that quick. They're, they were a lot quicker than they are, but they're a whole lot stronger than we are as, as humans and that they're dangerous. And it's like, well, what do they want to do you know, to people? And he really didn't go into that except that they were dangerous and to just be aware that you wanted to get away from them if you 
or ever finding yourself in their presence. <clears throat> well, this reptilian person looked like a, the body, like a person, but with scales. And it had like a lizard head. It was just freaky looking. Color. Color. Uh, it, the color was uh, kind of green with gray. Greenish gray. And what about those eyes? Were you seeing? Uh, were you seeing pupils? Were you see- What color were you seeing in the eyes? Just mostly black. It was almost like looking at a snake's eyes. And could you see a vertical pupil? Yeah, it had vertical, and it had like little gold lines around the um, the, the the vertical pupil part of it. Right. That is one of the most common descriptions. And was that lizard head like a lizard we might all know if you described? Oh, probably. I would think so. It, it, it was almost like a dinosaur head. And was it big as big as we think of the ratio of a human head to our neck and body? Was this a big dinosaur lizard head on a big body? It was a big body and a very thick neck, but the head looked a little bit larger than what I would have thought that it would be. Um, it, it wasn't a small head at all. Could you see the numbers of digits on the hands and were there claws? Um, I didn't see any claws and the hands. I didn't see that clearly. Um, I just noticed that there were hands, there were fingers, but I don't remember how many digits there were or if there were claws because it had like fists and it was pushing through uh, this bamboo. Hmm. And what happened to you? You're running and what happens? Well, it finally caught up with me and knocked me flat and just looked over and when it opened its mouth, it had sharp teeth and then it was all over. And when it was all over, do you mean this was a hologram or in in your mind only? It was just in my mind. It was a mental projection. They they taught things using mental projections. They would uh, have perhaps a geologist or someone who's in biology or physics or whatever, but they would show up and they would project this into my head somehow. And I could see all these details very clearly, and it happened so rapidly that, um, you know, I would just remember. And they, they'd they done something to cause me to remember because up to about 19 years old, I had a photographic memory because of all this. And what you're describing, if I'm understanding, is you thought, just like a virtual reality that we are hearing about today where people put on glasses, you thought that you were really in that tropical vegetation and that a reptilian humanoid was chasing you for real. Well, I knew that it was being projected in my head because I'd already been through this experience with other other things that they were showing me. But it was very real. And it, getting knocked down, that felt real. It, having, you hurt. Yeah. And, and having this thing lumber in front of me it was just huge. And this uh, weekend, uh, the uh, in March of 2017, I had a discussion with somebody related to uh, hopefully opening up the truth that we're not alone in this universe. And this is what I was told. For the first time, it makes a lot of sense. All of the ship shifting, ship the shape shifting that people in the abduction syndrome have reported for years and some people in Vietnam said they saw reptilian shape shifters that the movie uh, was made about and that uh, that in the current world of 2017 Jim Mars and I and others have compared cases where people have said They saw a human standing in front of them, dressed just like a human, and suddenly something happens, and that is an alligator or a lizard. It's still in clothes, but it turns from a human into an alligator and lizard. And the person with military background told me this past weekend, it is because the reptilians relate to anyone around them with controlling mind to mind. They make you see them as humans. And when there is a glitch of some sort, 
and you see what is really there, remember that is the reptilian among us looking like a human. Yeah, I was told the same thing. And that is, to me, my mind, maybe you would have an insight. I said, well, how is there something that the human mind, soul, spirit, body can react to if they're educated a little bit when they're in the presence of an actual lizard or alligator reptilian humanoid? I don't think there's anything you can do. These these beings are very powerful. They, just like these folks that I was talking to from Lanulos, they they were <clears throat> they were able to put something in your mind so you can realize it and, and really understand it. I've had experiences with these short gray alien beings, and they are far more powerful. They can project anything into your mind that they want you to see. And you'll accept what you're seeing as being reality. Um, so um, the graphic, like being able to make your mind project something that looks absolutely three dimensional. Oh yeah, I, I could tell you stories. I, I've seen some things that are just astonishing. For some reason, when they do it to me, and perhaps it's because of these earlier visitations that I'd had. <clears throat> it only lasts for about a minute or two and then it just goes away and I can see what's actually there. But for most people, by and large, from what I've had discussions with folks about, they don't know. I mean, you've heard these stories where it's there's a clown walking down the road. shouldn't be a clown there. Right. They're walking down a road with some balloons and the kids follow. The next thing you know, the kids wake up and they don't know what happened. It's because... When your mind is is open and relaxed and they get in there and put something there, you don't have any defenses to put up because you don't have any reason to. They do this before you ever see them. And as soon as you lock eyes with them, they've got you. Okay, and so uh, we're dealing with uh, non or, or what the government calls extraterrestrial biological entities in a variety of categories that can include the Zoe Blonde. Do you understand why Zoe e even interacted with you? Uh, and what I'm thinking of, Jerry, is you were born an orphan, Bob Lazar. From Area 51 uh, vintage, he was born an orphan. There are many people in the abduction uh, situation have been born orphans. And I have always thought it's because they're hybrids and they have been placed on this planet by extraterrestrials in this vast laboratory that we seem to be in and that they experiment in and harvest genetic material and keep creating clones and hybrids. Do you think you are a hybrid specifically for an experiment by Zoe and the uh, Talcetian uh, humanoids there? Well, I don't think I'm part of an ex experiment in that respect. The way it was explained to me is that I was brought here and the Army Air Corps, whoever the military complex was at the time, was informed I was going to be left someplace. And, of course... Military intelligence didn't get AM and PM right, so I stayed out there for like 12 hours and nearly froze to death. And this is when you were brand new born and <clears throat> saying the military knew that you were going to be born where you were born and they were to pick you up. Well, I'd already been born. I showed up there as a child and they came, got me, took me to the, uh, the hospital at, at Fort Knox. And that's where I stayed until I was assigned to a fellow in the service and his wife. And they couldn't have children, apparently. I found out years later. Um, my birth certificate was rapidly created. and um, By the military? I guess so. And doesn't that mean you are a hybrid? Well, I think a hybrid is when there's a cross-pollination of sorts between people on this world and people from another. Yeah. I think there's also, you know, what what would Zoe be? He's certainly not a hybrid. Of and 
a full blood ET from uh, the planet orbiting Tau Ceti. Exactly. Well, but there, there are other worlds out there, and these other worlds, they all have their own population base. And apparently, there are quite a few people who are here now that were brought here in much the same way because there, I was told there was something that was going to happen and that we were needed here. And that's the reason why we were brought here. Do you think it could involve a secret war, Jerry, for real, that there is some territorial dispute about what has been happening to Earth the genetic manipulation in already evolving primates to create various models of Homo sapien, and that there are blondes versus ebens versus reptilians versus insects in some sort of a territorial dispute. And if you go to World War II, and the fact that Admiral Richard E. Byrd was the first to fly in an airplane over the North Pole in 1926. And then two years later, he was the first to fly over the South Pole in Antarctica before World War II. And then after the war in January 1947, Admiral Byrd led the military expedition called Operation High Jump to Antarctica in another trip there for him allegedly to investigate Adolf Hitler's link to extraterrestrials and disc craft that were supposed to be in or under that icy continent we call Antarctica. And then two months later, on March 5th, 1947, the Chilean newspaper El Mercurio reported that America's Admiral Byrd announced it was imperative for the United States to initiate immediate defense measures against hostile regions in Antarctica. It was rumored that what Admiral Byrd had encountered were saucer-shaped silver disks that came out of the Antarctic water with what appeared to be force field shields that the Byrd military could not penetrate. Three United States ships, including a destroyer, were sunk in the alleged battle with the disks. Admiral Byrd and his men abruptly left Antarctica and arrived in America after the failed military operation on April 14, 1947. And later, Admiral Byrd testified before Congress with this warning, quote, in case of a new war, the U.S. would be attacked by fighters that are able to fly from one pole to the other with incredible speed, close quote, reported in the New York Times. Admiral Byrd did not publicly describe the silver disks that emerged from the Antarctic waters and attacked. But Jerry... This gives some historic context to the issue of why there might be efforts between blondes versus reptiles versus insects versus the, uh, the tall blondes and the and ebens about some territorial dispute that is still ongoing on our planet. And I know that you have a very good friend, Jeff Bird, Ph.D., who is in the bloodline of Admiral uh, Richard E. Bird. Can you talk a little bit now about that, what you, uh, your story with him and what has happened in his challenge? Well, basically, Jeff has been a good friend of Kathy and myself for quite some time. Um, <clears throat> Jeff is, I, I don't remember the exact, you know, how to say it. <laughs> He's great, great uncle or something like this, uh, of Admiral Byrd. And, uh, you mean Jeff is a great grandson or grandson to Admiral Henry Byrd, who was the one in World War II? Yes. Okay. Yeah, I think that's correct. I, I don't know. Absolutely. But um, anyway, we're, we, Kathy and I are currently involved in an effort to help Jeff. He, he's an amazing man, absolutely amazing. Musical genius. Uh, we started playing music with uh, Jeff 
about a year and a half ago, uh, maybe two years ago now at this point, uh, one of our first song that we submitted to the Grammys was picked to be on the ballot. You know, that's just something unheard of. Well, about, well, I don't know. It was several years ago. Uh, after a hurricane, Jeff found himself in this penthouse where he had ridden out the hurricane. He was fine, but it, the power was out. And so he had to climb down the stairs and get out of this place. And in doing so, he had to wade through, had to make his way through water that was stagnant, polluted, full of bacteria. It was nasty. And he was there in this tropical place because he was studying dolphins. Well, he was doing something of that nature. He, he was He's an amazing electronics wizard, and he was doing something in that capacity down there. Um, so he's down in Florida, and he made his way out. This bacteria uh, got onto his legs, and it burrowed into his skin. So after the course of a few years, and I'm sure Jeff could tell the story much more accurately than me, but after several years it basically deteriorated his legs to the point to where he either, well, he didn't have a choice. He had to have them amputated. So above the knee, he had his legs amputated. He's been staying at uh, this house of some folks that he knows. And a few days ago, he was given an eviction notice. Well, Jeff, you know, he, he doesn't, hasn't been able to work. He doesn't have any money. And he doesn't have the capacity to take the things that he's been able to save from because he left his house and lost a lot of stuff. Um, so we're trying to put together a fund to help him, to get him out of there and to get him out here to Arizona. We have the studio set up here, the corporation for our record label set up here. And Jeff's the president of that. So we're trying to raise money to help Jeff get out here. And he is where now? He's in Nashville, Tennessee. And he is the grandson or great-grandson of Admiral Richard Byrd, who did all of those record-breaking explorations uh, after World War II. I don't know if it's grandson or uncle. I think it's, I think it's uncle, Kathy says. So it was the uh, Emerald Bird was like his great great uncle, I think uncle. it was. Okay. Well, so you can see nephew. He would be a grand nephew then. Yes. Okay. So that's what we're trying to do. Um, we're we've got a fundraiser going on to try and help Jeff. Uh, I don't know what he's going to do if this fails. I just don't have a clue because he really doesn't have any resources and nowhere to turn. And no more family that is uh, surviving. That's right. That's and right. what can people who are listening now, both in the United States, and we have a lot of listeners around the world, uh, knowing that in these generations later, uh, that this very talented man uh, is really up against the wall for his own survival now, how can they help him? Well, it's real simple. Um all you need to do is go to, for example, my website. Go to jerrywills.com and scroll to the bottom of the page. You'll see a video there. Watch the video. At the end of it, there's going to be a little thing that shows up you can click, and that's where you go to the page where you can make a donation. We we need to raise about $10,000 to do this. Um because we need to find a house for Jeff and get some of the things you would have in a house, of course. Uh, utilities on, deposits paid, and all of that. But also to go there, Kathy and I, go there and get a rental truck, load it up, and drive it back here. I'm not sure that Jeff is going to be able to ride in our van or the rental truck, so he probably will need to fly from Nashville to Phoenix to be picked up by someone on this end, and we have that covered. So it's an arduous task, you know, it's, it's just, it seems like an awful lot of money and it is, but you know, this is to, this is to basically save someone who is our best friend in the entire world and, and an absolute gift to the human race for his capacity and what he's, what he's able to do. You know, you think about a person losing their legs, um, the pain and, emotional trauma 
but Jeff is a positive person. He's he's handled handled this with grace. Well, Beyond. yeah, and Jerry, the thing about it tying back to uh, his grand uncle, uh, Admiral Richard Byrd, was he left anything through that family bloodline? in papers, documents, photographs, or anything that he himself, knowing you, and the fact that you have had face-to-face contact with an extraterrestrial who says they're from Tau Ceti and been to perhaps another dimension uh, through Aramamuru in Peru, has he anything that was left in the family or even a legacy in telling that Richard Byrd said that we had extraterrestrial flying saucers at Antarctica? Um, I can't go into it too deeply because I don't have Jeff's permission, but I can tell you this. Uh, Yes, there is a legacy there. He does have knowledge. He also has information, the things you would expect. He, He has some things. And <clears throat> as amazing as, as uh, Admiral Byrd was, if I told you the story about who Jeff's father is and what his involvement was with the alphabet agencies, you would sit down and go, oh, really? The, there's, there's an enormous story here and an, an incredible lineage. It's, it's just absolutely astonishing. It's just absolutely astonishing. Since his grand uncle was exposed to a, a secret war between non humans and his own men, today does Jeff Bird have an insight about the secret war that is going on either around and even over perhaps what happens to humans in terms of geopolitical territorial conflicts? by an alien presence. Oh, yeah, we've had those conversations. One of the things I think is most interesting is what we call the reset. And the reset basically is a function where the timeline goes to a point, and then in order to maintain control over this planet, or however that might be characterized, I might not be saying it exactly right, but in order to maintain their position here, Somehow, everything goes back and it gets reset. And this has happened over and over again on this world. And some of the stuff that he had to tell me about involving the reset has to do with stopping this so it doesn't happen again. And the reset sounds like computer simulation going back to the dimension and your experience with their experimenting, is that my understanding that the reset would be like resetting a computer game for this universe and our planet? And then all of a sudden, you're back to Stone Age and starting all over again, and in 10,000 years, you'll have made your way to the point of Picasso painting a picture. Why would they do that? Well, because it's necessary if they're going to maintain their position. In other words, this is to keep control over us or certain life forms in this universe. But there are other allies now that are really, truly trying to break this terrible cycle in time and free us and free others in the universe that are under chokeholds by the reptilians and others like them. Yeah, exactly right. And that might have some clue as to why. Some of us were brought here to assist because they said something was happening and something was going to happen. And there was something we were supposed to do to help with that. Well, I think Jeff holds one of the keys to this. There was something that um, I can't talk about, but something that he discovered. And it has to do with music. And it has to do with um, the further evolution of the human spirit, let's say. Frequencies. Yes, exactly. It has to do with cymatics. Um, the, the, it's a rather, eh, it's, a, it's quite an in-depth thing to even start talking about. We could talk for two hours on this. Well, listen, I'll tell you what, we're coming to the close of this amazing show. And if some of the rumors are true, 
and that in this year, we are finally at least going to get the headlines around the world. We are not alone in this universe. And the cement begins to crack from all of the lies and political policies of denial. Jerry, we should do a whole other show with you and Jeff Bird in as much as you two can talk to us on Phenomenon Radio. Thank you so much for being on this show tonight. This has been very important, and I really hope we can go into all of what we just left off in great depth for another two hours before New Year's of 2018. Well, it's been a privilege to be included on your show. If people can help, please go watch the video and do the best you can. And give that website again. It's jerrywills.com, J-E-R-R-Y-W-I-L-L-S.com. Go to the bottom of the page. Watch the video. It explains everything there. What it doesn't explain is how important we feel Jeff Bird is and why we need to rescue him and get him to a safe place. Thank you, Jerry Wills.